How did a regular doctor who was loved and respected by his community kill over 265 people and become one of Britain's most evil? Keep watching as I investigate Harold Shipman, a.k.a. Dr. Death. Frederick Shipman was born on 14th of January 1946 in Nottingham. He was his mother's favourite child. However, she was a domineering figure in his life. She brought him up to believe he was superior, which would later leave him isolated with not that many friends. However, he would become a brilliant student at school and excelled in sports, particularly rugby, which you Americans would call American football which in my eyes is more American handball, but there you go. At age 19, he met Primrose, who would become his wife when she was pregnant with their first child at age 17. Around the same time, his mother was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer and Harold would take his first steps into the life of a health practitioner by overseeing her care as she spiraled downhill until she took a final breath on 21st of June, 1963. It was during this time that lifelong fascination with the drug morphine began. Spurred on by the death of his mother, he decided to go to medical school at Leeds University and begin his path to becoming Dr. Death. In 1974, Harold Shipman found himself in the middle of a suburban English family life. He was a father of two and held down a job as a doctor in the local medical practice of Todd Morden in Yorkshire. He was well liked and respected. However, things took a very dark turn when he found himself addicted to the extremely strong painkiller Demerol. To maintain his illegal habit, he would forge prescriptions for large amounts of pethidine. But a year later, in 1975, he got careless and his medical colleagues found out. He sharply fell from his pedestal of respectability and was forced to leave the medical practice in disgrace. He swiftly entered a drug rehab program and for his crime of forging prescriptions, he received a small fine of £600 and a conviction for forgery, which really, the equivalent in my opinion, my conspiracy, my theory, my whatever, was a proper slap on the wrist and no else. Now, you would think that this would have derailed his career as a doctor and forced Harold Shipman to discover a new profession. However, only a few years later, he was able to snake his way in as a doctor into Donnybrook Medical Center in Hyde, where he would remain for nearly 20 years. Yay for the NHS! Uh, just like before, though, he established an image of respectability and in turn was well liked by both patients and his colleagues. Chillingly, knowing what we now know about Shipman, he was especially renowned for his bedside manner. However, underneath this facade as a caring family doctor was a darkness that would lay unhidden for decades and what would emerge would place Harold Shipman in history as one of the most infamous prolific serial killers of Britain. Dr. Death would emerge into the world with his first known victim, 70-year-old Eva Lyons. While Shipman was working at the Abraham Omerod Medical Practice in Todd Morden on the eve of what was to be her 71st birthday, Eva's life came to a tragic end at the hands of Shipman. He had injected her with a lethal dose of the powerful drug diamorphine and reveled in watching the life in her eyes slowly and painstakingly slip away. The sick so-and-so. Emboldened by the fact that Shipman had literally just gotten away with murder, he had acquired a horde of the strong painkiller diamorphine, which, you know, 
being a collector and all that, that would fuel his bloodthirsty lust for killing for literally decades. Each one of his victims would be given the lethal dose of diamorphine and he would either watch with delight witnessing their lives slipping away from their fingers or send them home to die on their own in confusion and fear because, you know, keeping it real here, you go to your doctors with the expectation that they're going to try and make you better and, you know, not have the notion that they're actually going to freaking kill you. You know what I mean? Sadly, though, it's believed that the youngest of his victims was four-year-old little girl called Susie Garfit and the oldest, 93-year-old Anne Cooper. Either way, regardless of the age, one constant remained. He would target the most vulnerable of his victims and ultimately they did not stand a chance once his murderous gaze turned towards their direction. Now, although Howell Shipman technically was convicted of killing 15 of his patients, check this out. It's speculated by an independent government inquiry, so like the official top dogs here, that the number of his victims could have been over 265 people i shiz you not now with so many victims he was able to cover his tracks methodically with an obsessive attention to detail by adding false illnesses to his victims records he'd also manipulate the information on the patient's records to lie about their cause of death and you know with many of his victims he was killing to make a living now what the hell do i mean by that if what he was doing wasn't sick and twisted enough for some he'd forged the wills of his victims that would put him in a position of getting his hands on all of their moolah money leaving the grieving families with absolutely nothing he'd also make sure that some of his victims were cremated in order to cover his tracks and hide the true cause of death absolutely despicable right now with these methods to hand his alter ego of dr death would go undetected for over 25 freaking years and with so much success in being this evil how the deuce was he found out in the end it was 24th of june 1998 Former mayoress Kathleen Grundy began another day in blissful retirement, which, you know, is uh, all right for some. And despite her grand old age of 81, she was fit and healthy. However, she wouldn't live to see the sunset. Shipman visited her at a college early that day under the guise of conducting a uh, routine blood test. But instead, he cruelly delivered a lethal dose of diamorphine. Friends became increasingly concerned where they didn't see her out and about and later on in the day made their way into Kathleen's home to find her lifeless body, fully clothed, slumped on the sofa. Now, as Shipman did with his other victims, he forged a will in order to steal not only a life, but, you know, all of her money too, as you do. However, his greed ended up blinding him in the end and pretty much biting him in the ass. On the will, he declared that she had died of natural causes and ticked off the cremation box. But Kathleen wasn't cremated. She ended up being buried. Now, at the time, Hyde solicitors were administering the estate of Kathleen Grundy. And during the probate process, they found the discrepancy on the will with the cremation box being ticked. They immediately alerted Kathleen's daughter, Angela Woodruff, and her alarm bells immediately went off like nobody's business. She made her way over to the police to make her concerns known. And on 1st of August, 1998, they exhumed her mother's body and they found traces of, ding, 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 diamorphine in her system. You know it makes sense the next bit. The authorities attention immediately turned to Shipman and his horrific crimes began to unravel extremely quickly. They found his fingerprints on the forged documents and they found his typewriter, which was an extremely important piece of evidence, by the way, that helped stop Shipman in his tracks. On 7th September 1998, they obtained enough evidence to arrest that piece of shiz. Over the months that followed, computer experts forensically analyzed Shipman's computers and found direct and undisputable evidence that he had made false entries to support the false causes of death that he would give on his victim's death certificates. Furthermore, the detectives would start to uncover the tip of the iceberg when it came to the enormity of Shipman's crimes as they exhumed a further 11 victims within a two month period. Ultimately, with the 
overwhelming evidence that was hanging over Shipman. The authorities charged him with 15 counts of murder and one count of forgery. Over a year after his arrest, the trial took place at Preston Crown Court on the 5th of October 1999. The prosecution argued that Shipman had murdered in order to maintain and experience his perceived control over life and death. Ultimately thinking that he's God, basically. The defence argued that he had acted with the utmost compassion with all of his patients and victims, but the prosecution called BS and all of that, and uh, yeah, I would too. Uh, they hammered back, saying, how could that be when none of them were diagnosed with a terminal illness? Kathleen Gundy's daughter, the one who first rung the alarm bells about Shipman, took the stand and testified against him. The state's pathologist also took to the stand and took Shipman down piece by piece uh, with his post-mortem findings, concluding that the diamorphine was the cause of most of the deaths. Fingerprints left by Shipman on Kathleen Gundy's will provided the suspicion that he had forged it. What really took it home, though, and really hammered the nail in his coffin for the prosecution was the fact that Kathleen Grundy had never handled the will herself. Her fingerprints were nowhere to be found on it. Furthermore, the handwriting expert turned round to the court and confirmed that the signature was a total rip-off fake. Just like a total rip-off fake Gucci bag. A police computer forensic expert testified how Shipman altered the computer records to falsely declare symptoms that his victims never had, which would then fit into his false narrative of the cause of death, which he would then proclaim, of course, on their death certificates. During the course of the trial, Shipman's pattern began to emerge as other victims' relatives would recount how he had a lack of compassion with them, a resistance to help revive patients when they fell into bad states and generally not giving a damn about the relatives of his patients when they visited. More secrets would come to light during the trial that would plunge Shipman's sickening behaviour into the realms of literally the unbelievable. In the presence of relatives, when his victims would start making a sharp decline, Shipman would uh, pretend to call 911 and then play pretend again by cancelling the call when his victim passed away. The absence of these calls were totally easy to prove. All he had to do was just take one look of his telephone records and, you know, dude was screwed there. The court was then introduced to Shipman's wonderful hobby of illegally acquiring dimorphine, which he would either prescribe to patients that didn't need it or over-prescribe to others that actually did as a way of building up his own lethal stash himself. Shipman was exposed as an arrogant liar who constantly changed his stories and contradicted himself every which way you could pretty much imagine. With this and the overwhelming amount of evidence against him, on 31st of January 2000, the jury found him guilty of 15 counts of murder and one for forgery. I mean, to be fair, how could they not find him guilty? You know what I mean? Now, due to the prolific enormity of his crimes, the judge didn't waste any time in giving him 15 life sentences, as well as an additional four years for the forgery, and was sent to Durham Prison, where the judge made sure he would rot away behind bars for the rest of his life. Following his conviction, in 2001, Shipman was questioned by police again in relation to more deaths that were deemed especially suspicious and occurred during his tenure as a GP in Todd Morden, West Yorkshire. Now, taking a look at these pictures, he's shown various images, yet he sits there with his back turned towards the police officers and his eyes slammed shut, refusing point blank to help in their inquiries. But it was the one of his assumed victims, Elizabeth Pierce, which drew an unusual reaction from Shipman. This recording of part of their interrogation shows that as soon as his eyes lay on Elizabeth, the air out of his lungs are literally knocked out of him and he is totally proper frozen in fear of the ghost of Elizabeth looking back at him. You might be asking yourself, what drives someone to have the desire to kill over 260 people? Well, hell if I know. 
But with Harold Shipman, many have theorised over the years over why he did what he did. Now, some say that it was a cockamamie way of avenging the death of his mother. Others say it had a twisted logic of easing the burdens of the NHS by killing the elderly. Because that's logic. Uh, a large portion state that his ego was so big he couldn't resist playing God and relished in the power of saving life as quick as he could take it. For me, my opinion, my conspiracy, my theory, my whatever... I think he did it for the moolah, the absolute Benjamin's the money. Killing his victims, forging the wills so that all their money would end up in his hands. For me, it was totally all about the money, money, money. And for shipment, he would kill anyone in order to get his hands on their moolah in the end. Put simply, on 13th of January 2004, Shipman was found dead in his cell at Wakefield Prison after committing suicide. And not a tear was shed. This would be the grisly and cowardly end of Dr. Death. He carefully created an image of being a respected doctor who was a pillar of the community, but used his skills to end over 260 lives and used his access afforded to him as a GP to cover his tracks. This would ultimately make Harold Shipman, aka Dr. Death, one of Britain's most evil. If you like this and you want more, then make sure you subscribe to join our Alter Nerd tribe. Like, share, comment, all of that good stuff. And until the next time, you guys, laters.